Do you want more efficient speakers? Do you want more sensitive speakers? Are those the same thing? Welcome to Lancaster Hi-Fi. Let's talk about speaker efficiency and or sensitivity and whether you want speakers to be more efficient and or sensitive. If you ask in an online forum what makes speakers more efficient or sensitive, you're likely to trigger a discussion of the terms themselves. What is efficiency? What is sensitivity? And there's not super broad agreement as to what those two terms mean, whether they're even different things. When I started researching this video, I didn't really understand or appreciate the difference between these terms. Efficiency is generally a measure of the ratio of power out versus power in. If I put a certain wattage into a speaker, what is the power that I get out in terms of, say, a sound pressure level? And that's complicated by the fact that a speaker radiates sound in many directions, and we're specifically, our heads, our ears, are more or less at a point in space. So we're only going to get a fraction of the power that's put out by the speaker into the room. Never mind the efficiency uh, between power input and power generated into the room. Okay. Sensitivity, on the other hand, is a measure of uh, sound pressure level given a certain input. And the people who measure this and who seem to do the best job of of providing us with objective measures of sensitivity have settled on that standard input being 2.83 volts RMS. But you also really need to know the speaker impedance. Why is that? Okay. Because often you will see efficiency and or sensitivity used interchangeably when you look at speaker specs and it will be often represented as sound pressure level in decibels at one watt at one meter distance. 2.83 volts into eight ohms equals one watt because wattage power equals voltage squared over resistance. So 2.83 squared over eight is one. Okay. Yeah, so that is te technically speaking sensitivity. Now, some people will um, say, well, efficiency is the wattage rating and sensitivity is the voltage rating. It's no, uh, efficiency purely, you know, more, most technically speaking is a percentage or a fractional number. And we can do math there as to, you know, well, there are some interesting equations and in math that get to whether we really want efficient speakers and why, why aren't speakers generally more efficient than they are? Given this definition of sensitivity, say let's go with the 2.83, let's go with the sound pressure level in decibels, given a 2.83 volts RMS input at one meter distance, and let's also throw in there that we need to know the speaker impedance, whether it's four ohms, six ohms, eight ohms. We might also want to know, well, what's the sort of nominal impedance versus what's the minimum impedance? And what does nominal actually mean? A lot of speakers will tell you that their nominal impedance is eight ohms. Sometimes they will give you a minimum number. So for example, let's uh, I'll share with you the specs of my ADS L730 speakers. I originally bought the ADS L730s, or originally I was interested in them because they published a spec that said that they were relatively efficient. ADS reported their efficiency or their sensitivity. I think they called it efficiency in the spec as 92 decibels sound pressure level with 2.8 volts RMS, and then they put in parentheses one watt, which is actually a lie, pink noise input measured at one meter 
in a typical listening room, in parentheses, 2,000 cubic feet. What's 2,000 cubic feet? Let's see. Uh, let's think uh, 10 by 10 is 100, um, 20 feet roof ceiling. Okay, no, wait, wait. Uh, let's say 10 by 20 is 200 by 10 foot ceiling would give me 2,000 cubic feet. Okay? So that's a, I suppose that's a reasonable value for a typical listening room. But let's pick that stat apart, or that spec apart. Um, oh boy, so so first of all, we need to know, and they do report, the impedance. And they report it as 6 ohms, nominal, 4 ohms, minimum. Given the impedance of 6 ohms, that 1 watt in parentheses is a lie. Because given 2.8 volts RMS into 6 ohms, the power is voltage squared divided by impedance, and 2.8 squared over 6 is 1.3 watts. Oh. Then there's the bit about that typical listening room. That is, that 92 decibel sound pressure level is an in-room value, which is typically greater than an anechoic value by 2 to 3 decibels, maybe more. So how should I compare this in-room value for a 6 ohm speaker to the value for an 8 ohm speaker in an anechoic chamber or measured, you know, pseudo anechoically or simulated anechoically. Don't know. I love me some ADS speakers, but damn, they are not as efficient as I expected them to be. Now, I have compared them to some other speakers. Specifically, I listened and recorded them alongside my Acoustic Research AR4Xs and a friend's Tannoy Monitor Gold speakers, which I've read have an efficiency of 93 dB. Okay, so we have our three speakers. We have our ADS L730s that say that their efficiency, or sensitivity is it? 92 dB. The AR4Xs I've read have an efficiency or sensitivity. Now let's go with sensitivity here and let's try to be consistent of 87 dB, and then the Tenoys I've read have a sensitivity of 93 dB. So in general, I would expect the Tenoys to be louder than the ADSs, and both the ADS and the Tenoys to be much louder than the ARs. What's a dB? Like, does one dB matter? Well, yeah, one dB matters. What is dB, first of all? dB is a log scale. If you're looking at, say, power, then I believe dB is 10 times the log of the power, log base 10 of the power. And so it is a log measurement, and it works out so that when I increase sound pressure level by 3 dB, I double the power. Okay? So 1 dB matters. But that's in terms of power. That's not necessarily... You know, why do we use a log scale? If, would it be better to use an absolute power number for sound pressure level in terms of wattage, say? Well, that's not really how our ears work, or at least not how our brains in conjunction with our ears work. Our perceptions tend to work on something like a log scale, and that, that's in terms of brightness of light, intensity of sound, maybe the others as well, I don't know. But I know for those two, to perceive a, a, a significant difference, you know, you need to increase the power on a log scale. So dB is weird that way, right? So one dB, you might actually not notice that even though it's significant in terms of the power. Boy. So my perception would generally be that the Tenoy speakers would be a bit louder than the ADS and that both of those would be quite a bit louder than the ARs. So I, I took a lot of video and you know when you do the video editor you get the little sound thing at the bottom and it uh, you know, you can see the, the the magnitude of the sound by how far the peaks go and so on, right? And going from the 
you know, either the ADS or the Tinoy to the ARs, you know, yeah, it drops off significantly. It looks like about, you know, half the magnitude. But there's also a significant difference in the loudness going from the ADS to the Tinoys. You, they're definitely different. And, you know, is it 1 dB or, or more? Who knows? Because, you know, the Tenoy specs, I don't think were produced by Tenoy. <laughs> Seems likely that they're actually a bit more honest than maybe ADS's numbers. Because again, that in-room value is, you know, going to give you 2 or 3 dB because of the echoes, right? Oh boy. So those are how those numbers kind of work. And it, and, and it, and again, it's tricky, you know, at the one watt output sort of level into eight ohms, it may be that that 2.83 volts is actually the better reference. As long as your amplifier doesn't have trouble driving four ohms, it's going to maintain that same voltage into either, you know, if I switch back and forth. Maybe. And that's not even a guarantee because there's such a thing as voltage sag due to current draw. Some amplifiers, for example, have trouble with even the ADS 6 ohms or minimum 4 ohm speakers. And I suspect their problem is with that 4 ohm minimum. It's not that they can't drive 6 ohms. It's that, you know, once you, once it encounters those much lower impedances in part of the spectrum, it starts to sound funny because part of the sound gets kind of dropped out. Now things can be a bit different with tube amps, and I'm just not going to get into that because it's just kind of complicated, but um, because it's like, well, are we going from the 8 ohm taps or the 4 ohm taps, or are we just using 8 ohm taps and plugging into 8 ohm speakers, 6 ohm speakers, or 4 ohm speakers? It, all those things are variables and going to be different and uh, and then tube amps are generally not as powerful. Um, and so driving at one watt is for a so-called flea power amp that may max out at three watts, that may be a significant fraction of the total power it's able to produce. So we already have a problem as consumers looking at the world of speakers out there and looking at their published sensitivities sometimes that number being inter used interchangeably with efficiency. We already have a problem with all those numbers being measured in potentially different ways, some of them more inflated than others. Given, even given that, what is it we want out of a speaker and what should we expect out of a speaker? Do we, do we generally, should we generally prefer more efficient speakers? And there I'd say it really depends. If you want efficient speakers because you're using a very low powered amplifier, then yeah, you want efficient speakers if you want to listen at higher volumes. But what are you going to give up? Because there is no free lunch in life, right? You're, you're, you're going to pay the price somewhere. So in a nutshell, what we generally give up with more efficient speakers is bass. That's because of physics which we can encapsulate with Hoffman's Law or Hoffman's Iron Law. Hoffman's Iron Law states that for a vented speaker, not even quite sure what that means. Anyway, for a vented speaker, the, the efficiency in terms of percent is proportional to the volume of the box times the minus 3 dB frequency. What's that? The minus 3 dB frequency or F sub minus 3 dB, or sometimes simply referred to as F3, is the frequency at which the sound pressure level drops by a half, or minus 3 dB is half, okay. And so what that means is that you just can't get around the fact that as you go into lower and lower frequencies, if you want to have decent efficiency at those low frequencies, you got to have a bigger and bigger box. And since it's volume of the box, you, you, you run into some pretty big boxes in order to get even decent bass. Hence, your La Scala's that are pretty damn big, but aren't known for having very good bass. Hence, your corner horns, which have humongous boxes, still not known for delivering very good bass. 
because they are so super efficient, in order to maintain that high efficiency at lower and lower base, you, the, the size of the box gets unfeasible. Yeah, you, you can't build a big enough box to get those low frequencies. So how have we, how has hi-fi evolved? You listen to a lot of recordings from the 60s, especially the earlier 60s, there is not much bass. Even into the late 60s, you know, even some of the Beatles stuff like Let It Be, Abbey Road, there's not a lot of bass in there. You move into the 70s and all of a sudden the mixes include quite a lot of bass. You might not hear this if you don't have speakers that can deliver that bass or a good subwoofer. Well, why is that? What happened? Well, tubes gave way to solid state. With tubes, you know, it gets very expensive to get high-powered tube amps. Uh, not only do you have to use bigger, more expensive tubes to get higher power, but you need that bigger iron, which is, you know, the iron itself is more expensive, and the cost of shipping really heavy iron, wow, you know, gets pretty big. And so, the cost of a high power tube amp is large relative to the cost of a high power solid state amp. And so with solid state, with the transition from tubes to solid state, amplifier power started going up like crazy. We had the receiver wars, right? We had went from the flagship pioneer receiver in 1972 being 54 watts per channel, which is pretty fucking amazing. By the end of the 70s, we've got the Pioneer SX1980, which has some ridiculous like 270 watts per channel, right? And nowadays, it's, you know, if you really want high power, you can find some really high power amplifiers. And the, and the reason is, you know, this isn't just total gimmicks. It's not all about headroom and so on. And, you know, this mythical headroom, because we only ever listen at one watt. You know, part of the reason you want that higher power is so that you can use speakers that are less efficient or less sensitive. And why would you want to do that? Because in order to have low bass at a level commensurate with the rest of the frequency spectrum, you can build a huge box to bring the bass up, but you know, there's only so big a box you can build, or you can bring down the rest so that you can deliver the strong bass relative to the rest of the spectrum. That's why speakers in general have become less efficient moving in, you know, out of moving into the 70s and and to now. Because what you're going to give up with efficient speakers is bass. There's just, you know, hard to get around that. Now, if you still want to use that that very low powered tube amp and you, and you want a lot of bass and you don't want to go nuts with speaker size. And even if you did go nuts with speaker size, you know, good Lord, maybe you still just don't get, I mean, you know, again, clipped corner horns don't necessarily provide awesome bass up to lowest audible levels. You do different things. You get a powered subwoofer, for example, or you get, you know, some JBL monitors that actually um, have extra amplifiers built into them. You know, they're sort of passive, kind of, but at least at the lower base, they're not. They're active speakers. And then you can get very high efficiency, but it's kind of fake because you put an amplifier in the box. Because again, it's that base power that's hard to get. I talked about how some of the numbers published by the companies are misleading. And it's, you know, they're not necessarily misleading in terms of the sound pressure level that you will perceive when their speakers are played in a room. Where they are misleading is in trying to make comparisons to other speakers. And so you've got all these different companies, you know, fiddling with their methods. And even within companies, I mean, the numbers are sort of all over the place in terms of, of where they are relative to an objective measurement conducted in the same way for all these different makes and models of speakers. 
And so in order to get those objective numbers, you got to go to people like Aaron's Audio Corner, Audio Science Reviews, Stereophile.com, where you will find the objective measurements, not necessarily done in an anechoic chamber, but with a device and in a way that can account for the echoes in the room and, and essentially sort of simulate an anechoic value. And so you'll see, the, you know, all these diagrams and so on. And, you know, I'm always like looking down, okay, well, what's the bottom line? What's the, what's the average um, sensitivity? So, for example, let's talk about a relatively popular Klipsch speaker, the, the Klipsch RP8000F. Right, it's a floor standing tower speaker. And they say that its in room sensitivity is 98 dB. Well, Aaron's audio corner, Aaron measured it as 92. That's still pretty efficient, but it's not 98. I mean, that's a difference of 6 dB there. That's, that's a quarter. You know, going from 92 to 98, I double and double again the sound pressure level. And the, the bass isn't great. He measured the F3 or the F minus 3 dB, the point at which the bass rolls off to, to half the, the power, you know, say between 304K hertz um, as 67 hertz. I mean, we're all, you know, by 67, we're already, well, what's 67? I, I don't know offhand what note that is, but I do know that the low E on a bass guitar or bass violin is 40 hertz. And so that's a pretty good, so 40 hertz is a pretty good uh, milestone flag post, whatever, uh, for, you know, where do you want to be able to still hear the bass? You, you, you know, you, you don't necessarily need a speaker to give you down to 20 hertz, but you'd really like to get 40. So with this pretty big clip speaker, which has relatively high efficiency, high sensitivity, you're still not going to get any bass without a powered subwoofer. I mean, not get any bass. You're not, well, and it's tricky too, because you put it in a room, you put it near a wall, you're going to get bass reflections. And so you do boost the bass a bit, boost the bass a bit, putting it in a room and you can affect the bass given by a speaker by how you place it in a room, whether you put it in a corner, whether you put it closer to a wall or farther away. And I think you can even, you know, if you put a speaker in a corner, you can triple the volume. My dad had a, you know, a relatively powerful Macintosh tube amp, but you know, still a tube amp, so not super high power. He had very efficient speakers, but they were corner cabinets um, with, and they were vented so that they reflected off the wall. And so he had to, you know, in order to keep the bass in check with those speakers, he had to keep his bass on his preamp turned way down. That's sort of the other side of the story is, and it's why Klipsch corner horns, for example, are corner horns. In order to get decent bass, you stick them in a corner and you elevate those bass frequencies quite a bit by doing so. What speakers are out there that really do have very high efficiency? And let's say, let, by very, I mean like 100 dB. There aren't that many speakers for which the makers even advertise that they have efficiency, or I'm sorry, sensitivity of over 100 dB. And so in that category are, for example, Klipsch corner horns, Klipsch La Scala's. Now, when I keep calling them corner horns, I guess Klipsch calls them the Klipsch horns or K horns, colloquially. So Stereophile did actually measure the Klipsch horn A, the Klipsch horn AK6s at 101.1 dB at 2.83 volts at one meter. They noted how difficult it was to do that one meter measurement given how friggin' big the K-horn is. There's kind of a problem though that the impedance minimum on those K-horns is 2.7 ohms. And so you can run into some issues with that low in impedance. And those are also 15K a pair. 
uh, at least at the time of the writing of that particular review on Stereophile. They noted that the, the, the K-horns were the second most sensitive speakers they'd ever measured, that the most sensitive ones they'd measured were the Auditorium 23 Homage Cinema speakers which came out at a whopping 102.0 dB. And those are with the power supply. Ah, what, power supply? Yeah, those are powered woofers. Uh, and with that power supply, those are $55,000 a pair. <clears throat> they measured the K-horns at 101, what did I say? 101.1 dB. Klipsch says that their sensitivity is 105, so 4 dB difference. And the K-horn is huge. It has three horns. It's 53 inches high, 31 inches wide, 28 inches deep. Now, let's see. What are some other sensitive speakers, though? I mean, and again, looking at, at uh, objective measurements, say from Aaron's Audio or ASR or Stereophile. Um, we've got the Klipsch Heresy 4 at 94.5 dB. The DIY SGHTM 12 Mark 6 at 94 dB. Donnelly Sound Labs SH50 at 96.3 dB. Are any of those particularly worth having? I mean, I looked also at, you know, what are the when when people go online and ask, you know, what are the... I want some efficient speakers, but I also want some really good speakers. What should I get? One of the speakers mentioned typically is the Wharfdale Linton. By the spec published by Wharfdale, it's 90 dB efficient or sensitive. Huh. I'm going to screw that up through this whole video. But Aaron, Aaron's audio measured it at 85.1 dB. Dang, that's hardly efficient at all, really. Dang, dang, another like 5 dB difference between the spec and measurement. I mentioned already the the, the Klipsch RP8000F, which by spec says 98 dB, but Aaron measured it at 92. And let's talk about some others that, regardless of the spec. Um, Revel. The F328BE uh, was measured by Audio Science Review at 91.2 dB. And I said, it's a friggin' awesome speaker. Uh, it's also $18,000. Well, Revel makes a little more budget speaker that comes in at a bit under $1,000. Uh, the F35, which measured at... 90 dB, but they said it really needs bass EQ. I think they even said it needs the bass sort of brought down a bit because it just kind of destroys the rest of the sound. Let's see, the JBL HDI 3600, uh, Audio Science Review measured that at 89.9 dB, and that's a $1,000 speaker. The Snell Type J, comes in at like 89 dB. That's according to Hi-Fi Classic, and I don't know just how good that number is. Now, here's another trick that they can play. And again, I'm going to pick on ADS. Again, I love ADS speakers, but dang, okay? <laughs> so, so, I talked about Hoffman's Iron Law, but a speaker can employ some psychoacoustics to fool you. Hoffman's Iron Law says that, you know, a woofer in a smaller box can stay flat to lower frequencies by sacrificing efficiency, uh, or it can gain efficiency by sacrificing lower frequency response. Or a speaker can trick you by emphasizing a certain bandwidth so that low notes can produce high volumes but much of what you're hearing is the higher harmonics of those lower principles. There was a good discussion of efficiency on uh, AudioGon, specifically the user Opal Chip. Pointed the finger at Zoo speakers specifically in this business where, they, where you're perceiving 
that it has low bass because you're hearing a loud volume given the low principal note, say a low E. But what you're mostly hearing is second, fourth, sixth harmonics. Or at least that's a lot of what you're hearing. Great. So here's another thing I got a ding ADS for in their spec that they report for the L730s because they say the, the in-room sensitivity is measured uh, given a pink noise input. Well, what the hell is a pink noise input? A pink noise input is one where the power, uh, there's equal power per octave, which means in actuality that the power level drops as one over the frequency. Now, how is that the same as power per octave being the same? Well, because you double the frequency to go up an octave. So from 40 to 80 hertz, that gets you from the low E to the, uh, the E on the D string. 80 to 160 gives you another octave E and so on. And so you're dealing with bigger, you know, the more you double, the more, you know, an octave from 1,000 hertz to 2,000 hertz, that's a 1,000 hertz range in, in a single octave, whereas at low frequencies, uh, you only have a 40 hertz range to move an octave. Okay, so that's why pink noise is still legit. Again, because of the way we perceive sound. But they're telling me that they give a they're they're measuring the volume of pink noise or no 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 <laughs> they're putting pink noise in and they're measuring the volume out but that doesn't necessarily mean that the frequency distribution of the output is the same as the input <laughs> okay so it's potentially a very different thing from saying well if i put in a 40 hertz tone this is the volume of the 40 hertz tone that i get back out and only, you know, at 40 hertz plus or minus a narrow range instead of, you know, 40 hertz plus the 80 hertz harmonic plus the 160 hertz harmonic and so on. See what I'm saying? I mean, it's like the, if you play bass, you're using only the neck pickup and you play that low E and you pluck it sort of up near that pickup. You might produce a high volume, but you know, our, we, we have trouble kind of hearing that low. If you pluck it closer, if you, if you use more bridge pickup and pluck it closer to the bridge, you, you produce more higher harmonics and we perceive it as louder, even though maybe it isn't actually louder because we're better at, you know, it's, <laughs> we more easily hear those higher harmonics. And so, you know, it's not just does a speaker give you a certain loudness given a certain bass note, it's what does that bass note actually sound like? Does it sound like more like the bass note from a bridge pickup or more like the bass note from a neck pickup given a neck pickup input? And so when ADS says they're reporting their results as sound pressure level given a pink noise input, they're not telling me exactly how they're measuring the output, but I'm, I'm going to guess that they're essentially just looking at a, you know, DB in the room, given that pink noise input, regardless of, how, of whether that output reproduces or how well that output reproduces the input. So that's some psychoacoustic gameplay for you that, that Golly gee, it's not a huge box, but it still has this great bass. Well, yeah, maybe, but eh, not so fast. Jesus Christ, these guys are killing me. These speaker, ADS, you're killing me, man. I love you, but you're killing me. And this is the finger that they point specifically at Zoo as well. And there's some snide comments about reviewers who really ought to know better in the sense that, you know, Hoffman's Law is been around for a long time everybody ought to know it and still they're believing that zoo can make this super efficient speaker that also gives you low bass with a relatively modest sized box um, it's like no you just no that's impossible <laughs> it's not, sorry it's impossible and that's i guess what it really comes to right is that there are certain things that are physically possible and others that are not and you just kind of can't get around the this issue with once you're trying to get 
high sensitivity, if you also want low bass, you're going to have to have a huge box. And even given the huge box, you're still not going to get all that great low bass. But you can play with placement, you know, stick it in the corner like the K-horn, like my dad's uh, Electro Voice cabinets, you know, that kind of thing. So do I really want high efficiency speakers? I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm kind of torn at this point. We can listen, for example, to the difference between some speakers that are supposedly pretty high efficiency and some that aren't necessarily real high efficiency, sensitivity, whatever. Uh, these Hartleys versus the Wharfdales. Now, I don't know about you, but the Hartley actually sounded kind of louder than the Wharfdale. Now, I'm not sure that either maker published an efficiency or sensitivity spec. I have seen a number for the Wharfdale at 96 dB. That was like an ad for a used speaker. I, I've seen the original Wharfdale literature and it doesn't mention efficiency or sensitivity. I mean, it might tout that the speakers are sensitive, but it doesn't publish a number. So that 96 dB, I don't know where the hell that came from. I've just seen it. No context whatsoever. And I don't recall whether I've even ever seen a sensitivity number for, for the Hartleys. But just sticking a camera <laughs> in front of one and, and in front of the other, playing the same track at the same volume setting, they sound different. The Wharfdale's definitely got stronger bass, which makes sense. It's a bigger box. Maybe it is actually more efficient given bass frequencies require more power. Ay ay ay. So I'm thinking, right? I want to build, and I've talked about this in a video, I need to build a low power tube amp, single ended triode amp with type 45 tubes. That amp will max out at one or one and a half watts per channel. So if I ever want to use that amp to play loud music, especially loud music with any kind of bass, I would need some really efficient speakers. Do I want that? Or should I simply be satisfied at using good speakers to listen to that amp at modest levels, and then if I really want to jam out, switch to a solid state amp with lots of power. You know, I, I could see, for example, a system that had a decent preamp and where I could switch back and forth between uh, my ADCOM 100 watt per channel power amp and my Type 45 tube amp with one watt per channel. That might be actually a pretty good system. If I really want to rock out and with some strong bass, or I could buy amp, right? Now, buy amping is tricky. Do you, if the reason you're buy amping is at least in part because your amplifier can't do low bass very well, then you want to have a crossover between the preamp and the power amp and send, send frequencies above a certain level to one power amp and frequencies below a certain level to another power amp. So for example, say I pick 200 hertz, so I'm going to send everything above 200 hertz to the single-ended triode amp and everything below 200 hertz to the ADCOM 100 watt per channel solid state amp. And then send them to different speakers or combine them again and send them all to the same speaker. How do I recombine the signals? I don't even know if that's a thing. Shit. So if you're wondering about high sensitivity speakers, what are the good ones? Which ones really do have high sensitivity and how sensitive are they? And do they also deliver really good sound? I'm with you. I'm really still trying to figure out the answer. And, and here's where I'm coming to is that you know, ultimately, this no free lunch problem is a real thing. 
that every time you're dealing with these super high efficiency speakers, you're making some potentially pretty serious compromises about the quality of the sound. And typically that compromise is in the low bass. And so at that point, it's like, well, why even bother with these Mondo K-horns or La Scala's? Maybe I'll just get a powered subwoofer and just, you know, get the speakers that I think sound best. Maybe do the biamping. But, but I think some powered subwoofers will actually do that, right? That you take the preamp signal, you put it into the subwoofer, into the low-level outputs on the subwoofer, and then you send, you know, then you have your subwoofer outs can go to your power amp and then to your speakers. And you set the crossover on the subwoofer so that it sends a filtered signal to your, to your power amp. That may be really the best way to go. I mean, I've never, uh, I, I've never used a subwoofer. So yeah, this might be something new for me if I, if I want to go that way. This is a bit more of a rambly, less scripted video. Um, but I, but I think it's a really interesting subject. So I hope I maybe could shed some light on it for you. If you're going to get nothing else from this, don't trust the sensitivity numbers published by the makers. They're not even consistent among their different models in how far off they are. You know, it'd be one thing if, if like all of Klipsch's values were just like, a, okay, subtract 3 dB. But for some, it's a lot. For some, not so much. I mean, it's nuts. So you can't even trust the numbers and do really good comparisons among them, much less compare across makes. And so you really got to look at the numbers published by objective reviewers like Audio Science Review, like Aaron's Audio Corner, like Stereophile. And then also, well, you know, don't just look at the efficiency. Look at, is this a speaker you'd actually want to listen to? Because it could be really super efficient, but kind of sound like crap. Maybe not crap, but it's still making compromises that you hadn't, you wouldn't necessarily bargain on if you didn't read the review carefully. Well, if you enjoyed the video, please do subscribe, give it a like, give me a comment. I mean, that's probably something that some of you out there might have something to say about, so be interested to read it. Have a great day and I will talk to you later.